Good afternoon, dear guests, members. Uh, I would like to welcome you to our uh, uh, lecture. It's, uh, it's about authentic Macedonian cooking, and it's going to be given by Niki Alexiu, our resident uh, um, expert on cooking, Bob's cooking. Na dobar den, dragi gosti, členovi na Istorijskoto društvo. Sakam da me predstavam na Niki Aleksiju, da bi ja predstavam Niki Aleksiju na vas. Tani je naš ekspert u ogotvenje i to vam ogotvenje so recepti koje nam na naši tekst bavi. Blagodne. Hvala. Well, welcome to Baba, Cooking with Baba. My name is Niki Alexio. I'm from Selo Armensko, and I was born there. Uh, I left when I was 10 years old, and at 10 we went to France. I lived in France until I was 17, and then we ended up in Canada. So my family, they're all into restaurant business. My cooking started at that man's school with my baba. I want to give you a little background on the Makedonska baba, what was her purpose in the household around the children. We'll begin with the children. Baba took care of all the children. Baba happened to be a large lady. When you look at it from, ba from a child's point of view, she was very large, big bosom. When you were cold, she was warm. When you were hungry, she had a piece of bread covered into a small little cheesecloth under her arm with a little bit of sugar over it. If you said, Baba, I'm hungry, she'll open her breast and she'll have the bread. If you were cold, she'll put your hands in the breast and you will be warm. Baba was a very important person in the children's lives. When the children, when she finished the cooking in the evening, and the young people, they would end up cleaning up, the Nevesti and the girls, clean up after the dinner. Baba will gather all the children around her, and it was very warm. The youngest would be in her lap. It would be like a cradle. And the other ones would be so close to her that we almost fit into her body to get that warmth out of her. And she would tell us all the stories. The stories were about all kinds of little mice and everything, but most of the stories were called precosmi. They were out of the experience of the household. That's how they ended up. And we all fell asleep on her lap. And then when the mothers and the young ladies will end up picking up the children, put them in bed. And then the grown-ups will sit down around the table and discuss the next day's agenda. The agenda was where to go to work, what to do, and what fields they're going to go. If it was necessary and the workload was large, they would call one of the younger people who would stay home to do the bread which the bread consisted of uh, 15, 20 loaves. They used to make the bread once a week. So she will do the kneading of the dough, and then she'll end up by 12 o'clock, she will go to the fields, and then the baba will bake the bread. The bread was baked in this big clay ovens that they were made. Now baba's responsibility was to teach the children manners, to teach the children warmth, to teach the children how to cook, how to do everything without really teaching, which was an example of what she was doing. It wasn't taught. So when you grow up, you automatically knew what to do. Without thinking, you went to school to learn all this. In the spring, they would make their own clay. Baba will involve all the young children. They would have the clay and the straw, and they will make their own pottery, which the largest one they made was called tseretna. They used to make the bread in it. 
Then they had the pitulaca, where they made the crepes on it. And then they had the grinche, latvitsa. All these were made in clay. During my own Baba's time, which was late 18th century, her pots were practically bought, all of them, by then. But there were two that they were made every summer by the young kids, which was the pitularka and the serepna. They would have, they would work on it all day, the children, and in the evening, the Baba will come along and shape the pot, shape the pitularka and shape the terepna, and they will let them dry in the sun for a few days, and then they will bake them in the furna, which was the baking oven inside. They were ready for all the winter to make their bread. The, pitula, the terepna was made for small loaves of bread. If you were short of bread, you would make that, and that was made on the oven. You don't, on the fire, you don't put it in the clay pot. This particular uh, instrument was made, you made um, lented things, not things with uh, oil or anything like that. They made the pupalina, which were for church. You're not supposed to put except salt and water. They made the poracha, which there was nothing in it, except again, salt and water. And they made Zelnik in the springtime, which was done with no oil in it whatsoever. At those days, the Babas used to say, when they made the Posenzelnik, Korata ko vratata, vitkata ko grevata, izelieto petalo se zakači natre. So that they could dip in and eat out of this product. The fire was made early in the morning when Baba gets up. And once the fire goes on, it's on all day. The Baba will put the beans, which in the garne, that's a larger pot, long and large. It would put it in the fire in the coals. Now those beans, they would be so good because they were made out of everything so fresh, ever fresh preserved. We did not purchase anything in the villages except for salt, oil, and sugar. The rest of the remaining of the product were literally grown in the villages. So that's why everything was absolutely excellent. Baba's job was to preserve. To preserve the food for the winter and make sure she rations this food to last all the way until the spring. So in the, when they bring the, the sheep, they used to milk the sheep in the fields. When they brought the milk home, Baba will have to make the cheese, cottage cheese, uh, butter, matanitsa, siratka, all these things were made by her at home. The rest of the younger crowd, they were working in the fields, either with the, uh, um, the beef or the pigs or whatever they had, they were out of the household. Now when all this work was done by Baba, all the children were there playing around her and automatically they learned how to do these things without really learning, in a sense. When they made the culture to make the cheese, they had to slaughter a little lamb before it had any food and they would take the stomach of it, dry it, and that particular stuff that was inside of that baby's stomach, it was the culture of all beginnings of the cheeses. That was where the culture came along. When you did it with a very mild, it made it into a potziro. Potziro could mean a very sweet uh, culture for the cheese. So when they strain it, it ends up into balls of cheese, that's the feta cheese. Then the bottom of the, what's the drippings, it goes into a pail. When they boil that, it becomes a cottage cheese, which is the ricotta cheese. And then the remaining of the juice was called siratka. And they give it to us young people 
to drink it, which was very, very healthy. So there was no waste of any kind what was produced in our homes at that particular time. Then when the bread, when we make the bread, nobody ever heard of pita until they came to Canada. Well, that's not so. Pita was a household word to my household. When my mom made the bread, the oven was cooking, the clay ovens were similar to the clay ovens of pizza they brought in in the last five years into, the, into Canada, the Italians. That's the kind of furna we used to have, what we call. So when the furna was getting ready, Baba will make the pita before she puts the loaves in. And the pita will pop up, come up, and all the children, we would have pita. Now what she put in our pita was really great. She had a little bit of oil, a little bit of salt, and a little bit of chili pepper. And she'll open the pita, put some of that in, and that was our lunch, fresh lunch, before the bread was made. Now while the bread was going into the oven, we used to have a pechenitsa, which we call. You could have it with meat, you could have it without meat, all vegetables. They would put it into a tepsia, all kinds of vegetables, salt, pepper, spices. We used to have magdonos, nyasma, all these beautiful spices, chevrisa that we had. They would mix it all together and a little wee bit of oil. And they would put it in the furna to bake right along with the bread. When the bread comes out, the pechanitsa comes out, and it was excellent. The nevesta by 12 o'clock will leave some for the home for the children and the baba, and she'll take the pechanitsa into the fields with fresh baked bread, and that was their lunch. Now we ate, we have, they say we fillet fish in here. Well, we fillet fish in the olden days. So obviously everything begins from the very simple cooking into the modern cooking, except to do it a little faster now. At those days, when Baba used to bring the crab home, that was a carp fish, very, very big, and she would fillet. She would saute the portions filleted, and she'll take the bones. Now the sauteed filleted, she will send them into the fields for them for lunch. And then what we call lesna manja, she'll make with the bones a light dinner. Because what we needed was a very, very good breakfast, a very, very good lunch. And then for dinner, it was lighter. We make a light dinner. So with the bones, she will have an excellent broth. Either she'll put a pras or whatever she wanted to put in it. And it would be a very excellent manja for dinner with bread. So that's where our Baba begins. When I think about it, it was so much work for her. But for some reason or other, she had time for the children, she had time for the food, and she had time for everyone to sit in on the decision making how to cook, how to go to work the next day. The saddest thing is, now our Baba is put aside and the roots and the pleasure of a Baba is no longer with our children. And why we say we don't have a much family? Because we don't have the core and the roots of a Baba and a Dedo to hold the household together. Now we're going to do some cooking. Our Baba always had an early garden, very, very early garden, which came right at the beginning. We had the Magdonos, Nayasmo, Romice, Cevrita, Sarvenka, you name it, everything grew. Copri, and these things were very, very early coming, which you might say they were weeds. They grew on their own. But Baba gets up in the morning after everybody got to the field, the children trotting along behind her, and they would go to the grind shed. They would work in the grind shed. Baba will work on her side, 
and the children have a small one on the other side plant grass and they would copy Baba's garden and they would plant their grass so when these children really grew they knew exactly what to do in the garden because they were right along with Baba in there with all these weeds what do we do we make zelnik the zelnik you can make it with everything the spring zelnik is usually done with kopri but then if you don't want to have a kopri the early part of the potatoes the leaves they come along you can take the leaves of the potatoes the leaves of the tsarvenka you can take the leaves of all the spices you have there and you come home put some salt and pepper and a few spoons of olive oil and you make this big beautiful zelnik in the tsarepna the tsarepna you turn it over on the top of the coals you make sure it's hot you turn it over in the other end and then you put your zelnik inside and then we have something what do we call a sach you heat that up too you cover the tsarepna and you put coals on the top of the sach and for some reason or other she didn't have a clock she didn't have anything but she when she opened it it was beautiful and ready very very good to eat and of course the first first portion went to the children and then everybody else so that's why the children were very close to Baba for many many reasons when we had a manja because we didn't waste anything early spring when we put our leeks into the ground to last over the winter they're covered with uh, roshki pieces of wood and leaves and for some reason or other probably the it's not that cold there the leeks will not really freeze and we'll go and pull them off the ground even in the middle of the winter to do our cooking Pras is a very important ingredient to our family cooking due to the fact we can have a very simple manja they would bring the little uh, sironi what they're called smelt a very very small one and she will make the manja with pras she'll saute the leeks salt and pepper and she'll put the broth in it and she'll throw the whole little pieces of fish the sironi into the manja and a handful of rice it would make an excellent dinner and very very inexpensive which was very very good for everyone and then she will fry the ones dry and send them to the fields for them to eat in the, the grown-ups in the fields where they're working and they would have a solid food we used an awful lot of nuts obviously these people they knew nutrition we used to have the seeds from the pumpkins that we will use them we had sunflower seeds we had walnuts hazelnuts that we picked from the uh, from the mountains that where they had so there were an awful lot of things that we used so that way protein in meat it wasn't really that necessary in the springtime when the kopri grow that's when our prajoti come along which is one of our fa very famous food in our village prajoti is an escargot that grows right inside the kopri this this particular prajoti they grow in france italy and macedonia in the mountains the best prajoti in the world which are escargots they're fed with kopri and the flavor of these escargots they taste like kopri these particular ones so baba will bring them home and put them in a big pot and boil them and remove the shell they remove the lower part and she'll put them on the side you've got the recipe right in the front of you of that recipe so I won't go into it it makes a very nutritious and very excellent stew that particular uh, manja then on the other hand Baba will get up in the morning and she will go into the mountains in the mountains we have excellent 
excellent mushrooms that they grow. They only grow in the mountains of Italy, France again, and Macedonia. Under the leaves of the big oak trees they grow, there's so much leaves, people don't even walk there. This particular fungi, they grow, you have to pick them before sunrise, otherwise they will be eaten by the worms. So the first one is called Pechurki. The second one is called Manitari. And the third one is called Resulki. They are very, very expensive. The most expensive mushroom you can buy is the Manitari. And when you cook this Manitari, they have more protein than anything you can buy. And that's what Baba did early in the morning. When she got the resulki, they come into a size of a sponge. They even look like a sponge. They're cut in slices and sauteed in a very, very lean pan. And then it comes the beautiful makalo, what we make, which is a gravy of some sort. This makalo is made a very, very thick gravy. And she makes the makalo, she sautés the resulki. And they would be placed on the bottom of the pan, and then she'll put the makalo, and then the resulki, and then the makalo. She'll put it on the side, and to us, the piece of resistance was, she would sauté some feta cheese with red paprika, and a little bit of sweet butter, and when that is so bring to a boil, she'll pour it over the makalo, and the reason it's called makalo, you're supposed to dip in it, not eat it with a fork or a knife or anything. You take the crusty bread poraja and you dip in it. That's makalo. Makash is, that's why it's called makalo. That's one of our very, very good foods was. But makalo is made with many, many other things. We preserve pickles, we preserve peppers, and we preserve uh, tomatoes all in the same barrel. And that was Baba's job. Because when you pickle these things, in, in Macedonia they're not covered by jars or sealed. They would have to be remove the water every morning from one end and pour it over to circulate the juices of these peppers and tomatoes and cabbages all along. So when you take now this pickle thing and you make makalo, particularly the peppers, if you saute the peppers with a little wee bit of uh, olive oil and you make your gravy or makalo and you throw them in. And if you put a little bit of a cheese, a little bit of paprika, and you saute it and you pour it over, I tell you, when you dip into it and it drips over your chin, and it's so delicious. It keeps your ch chest wet and your mouth watering. Excellent. Very, very good. And this is Baba's job again. Because the cheese, you have to rotate the water in the cheese the same way. Every morning, Baba has to get up and rotate the water in the pickles, in the cheese, of all these things that we have, that they are preserved for the winter. Baba preserves all the fruits and vegetables. The nicest thing that we have to preserve is how they keep the grapes. They pick the best grapes of them all, and our grapes are sweet. When you pick the grapes, your hands stick from sweetness and sugar. They make holes in the silly and hooks and take the best gross doy of all. And the whole, whole room that we have for storage and they're hanging. The whole ceiling would be covered with gross doy. And now these grapes, they're not going to be dry. They're going to dehydrate a little wee bit. And they are so sweet. And that's where they used to pick the grapes to last for the winter. That's where the rationing came along. We preserve apples. We preserve apricots and plums. And all these things were dried by Baba. Then, the ones that they were not dry, we used to have plevna. 
Klevna is an item that where you store the hay for the animal. And usually it's not close to the house, it's a little further. So the children, to entice them to bring the hay for the animal, they used to preserve the crab apple, everything, chestnut, walnut, everything we had. They would put a layer of hay and they would put the apple. They put another layer of hay, they would put chestnut. They put another layer of hay, they would put the wal uh, walnuts, a uh, crab apple everything that we have. Now when you say to the children, would you go and bring some hay for the animal? Well, the children were delighted because when they go there, the treats were there. They will bring all the treats home and they will bring the hay for the animals. So that was Baba's ingenious way of getting the children to do their short without to force them. Our biggest problem here now what we have is we demand. I never remember anything being demanded of me from my Baba. And yet, everything she asked, I did. And I don't know how or why. So I believe our Baba is very important to be preserved. The household, the Baba, and all of us right along with them. Even nature. When the old tree dies, it falls into the ground. And when it's dissolved into the earth, that's what makes the young tree grow. That's where our Baba comes along and our dedo. It's a very, very important situation. We have so much to talk about our Baba, it's never ending. I would like to see all our young people to reissue Baba into the household, not to put her away and make her forget. Our Babas were never senile. Our Babas were never lost. The reason was they were useful until the day they died. The biggest problem that we have now is we forget about our Baba. But the problem is we forget about ourselves because we're going to be the Babas, the next generation. And what we do on our Baba would be done to us. I would really appreciate if you want any kind of recipe or any kind of questions, and if I can answer you, I'll be glad to do so. Thank you. You know, they build three houses and you move along. The people that they live together in a large family before the split, they all, the Baba had keys into her side. She kept everything under lock and key to make sure that the food that they had and the rules were obeyed and uh, to keep control of everything they had. That's what, that was the Baba. The reason, the reason I'm mentioning this is that 
something that we don't stress, but the big difference between the Greeks and the Macedonians is the fact that they are, in the Greek society, they are largely controlled by the males with the Macedonian society is not. Probably not. We never think of it that way because uh, uh, with, with the Macedonian household, duties were understood, were never really lectured. We, they were uh, duties that were understood. We knew what to do and we didn't demand. And the best part of all, if I can recall, at least in my household, that everything was done with love. Like everything, if you did a good job, it was wonderful. It didn't really make any difference who did it. Yeah. I can remember even bringing the situation up to my mother and my children. My middle son lived with my mother and father for a little while. And I say to my mother, you know, Mom, this is, would be too much for you. You know? And she says, no, don't be funny. She says, Ko tia mai spresam ta koshulata, tia pantalonites lechen uba fuba, i toi ko ke izleče od vratata, jaz ka ke oda na džamo da obira, da li je to ko uba v kokušo si misla. I toi, ke oj na ravota, i jaz ka se dvrna, i ke si potpevam veliko kičino ko ke oda. Praj. So everything was done with joy and pride and love. Yeah. Now, when you love what you do, it's not work. You don't dedicate the jobs. You just do it because you want to. When you do your cooking, it's not a chore. When you finish your good food and your child says, oh, mom, that was delicious. I mean, that's more than you can ask for. So these people, they had time for us, they had time for everything. In here, our biggest problem is we don't have any time. We have washing machines do the washing. We, should, we have uh, microwaves who do the cooking in five minutes. We have everything and we don't have time. I was always wondering why uh, in, in the territory, in the Balkans, or in Macedonia, generally, I'm talking not just the Republic of Macedonia, but all the regions that is under uh, occupied territory in Greece, mm -hmm. I should say, and in Bulgaria. Yeah. They find these uh, statues. Being a sculptor myself, I know that uh, you know that usually they have this uh, statue of a female, and these statues are found in all this area. They are they go back to who knows thousands and thousands of years. We're talking about eight, ten thousand years old. And we, we wonder uh, why were they here? And, and now it comes to light because the truth is that all the beautiful rivers and fields and everything is there. And uh, you know, they used to pray to the, to the female goddess. I always wonder why. And actually it's continuation because that was our Baba or the female who will give birth and give, feed the children and take care of the house. And in old days, we had more respect. I wonder, and I hope now we, sh we, sh we have for uh, mothers or for the old. Yeah. Uh, uh, I have one very young mother here. That's and wonderful. sometimes I, I wonder how can we bring them back to the house because now is the new modern way of putting them in the old age home or something. But it's more beautiful to be with us so, I don't know, it's just that we have to, you know, solve these things, but modern time brings modern things, and that's why we lose it. But I hope things like what you say will bring my children and they will learn something. If not from Baba, she lives far away, at least from you or her. Yeah. Well, I love that. It made me I'll tell you a little story. My, I have a cousin. He's a second generation American. And usually he comes and visits me. His name is Peter Johnson. Actually, his name was Peter Boduris. But he was so ashamed to be a Boduris, he changed his name to a Johnson. So every time you'll come, I'll make pituliti na pitularka, which they're made just simply salt, water, and a little bit of yeast. Okay, 
So when you do that, you make them very, very thin crepes. The best part to make this pitilisi, which they're so loose, you would have to make saute your garlic, very good virgin olive oil, salt, and boiling water. So you take each crepe, make sure the ends are a little bit dry, dip them into that boiling pot, and then place them in a plate. Then put a little bit in the center. So you carry on and you make a stack of it. Now they're very fattening, but they're very, very good. And every time I made, Peter was typical American. He'd wear his shirt open all the way to his belly button. Typical American. And he's chained out here. But he was such a gourmet, which is gourmand in French. That means he loved to eat. Every time he turns around, he takes one and he puts it in his mouth. And it was too big. And it would drip. He would have oil from his chin all the way to his uh, belly button. And he'll hide. And he'll try to wipe it out. And he says, this is so good. There is no other word to describe it. It's disgustingly good. I'm going to get fat. But that's how good they are. They really are very good. So everybody should learn, uh, either from their babas or from some cookbook. Virginia Evans right there, she's a person who collects cookbooks and all kinds of recipes. We should remember to keep these recipes. I was born in Macedonia 10 years. I was until 17 in France. Three years in Paris and three years uh, away, uh, four years away from Paris, about 30 kilometers. And from the cooking of my baba to the French cooking, there is really not that much difference. The French people, they make roux, which is with butter, with any kind of oil, and you make your roux to make your gravy. With, with our babas, it was a little different. Our baba, when she made bread, she would put a pan of flour and it would bake in the oven without the oil. Because the flour has to be cooked so your gravy or your sauce will not break when you boil it. Otherwise, if you make it like vari borai, it would break eventually. But if the flour is baked, it will not break. So they used to bake it in the clay oven when they made the bread. So that way you make your sauce. Now the French people, they make a very, very fattening gravy. Well, we make a very, very lean gravy. And most of the people, they were very lean. We ate well, but we were very, very lean. The only fat we usually have in Macedonia is when they slaughter the pig in the fall. When they slaughter the pig, the only way to preserve it is they cook all the pig and they put it in pails and it would freeze with the grease, with the fat of the pig, all of it. Then in the winter, they will take the meat out and they will make a dinner or a lunch, rucho, and they would take some of the fat and some of the paste, the tomato paste that Baba has. She will put a little bit of water and mix it together and throw some of those dry tomatoes in and we'll dip it with our bread. That was our breakfast. And that's how they preserve the pork. Preserving the beef was called pasterma, if you want to call it a beef jerky. And this comes all the way back. So the Americans did invent beef jerky. We did. <laughs> That's true. We have our pasterma. I hope it's not this cold power one. We can it Pasterma is the dry. Dry beef. Uh, how, uh, how different is the cooking from village to village, for instance? Well, uh, really the cooking is not that much difference. It's just a name or change. That's why I appreciated when I listened to uh, Christina Kramer's uh, lecture. I appreciated very much because he said, she said, what's unique about the Macedonian language? that each village has its own dialect and combine in a sense in one. At first, I thought it was a handicap for us, but she made me realize that it was really great. 
like the names would be called. For instance, like you say, tomatoes and tomatoes. Some villages they say cartoli, some villages will say um, patati, and some villages will say confiti. So, but still it's the same thing. We have gra and we have bo, which is the same thing. Fasu. So it's really the same thing. But for some reason or other, even if whatever term you use, it's still well known in the villages, it means the same. When Baba dried the peppers, I mean, this is really delicious. You should try it here in the winter. It's getting low on food, and we don't have very much left except potatoes, and we have the only thing we have left is, is the onion and garlic. Well, Baba will take the onions, and when she's got all these coals there hot, she'll take the onions right into the coals without taking the skins off and the garlic and she let them bake. Get them out of the coal, snip them with the scissors at the front, and press the end, and the onion comes cooked. So excellent. And the garlic. Crumble up a little bit of hot um, dry peppers over it, and a little bit of salt, and throw a little wee bit of oil. I'll tell you that is excellent. And if you have a steak right along with it, man, that's even better. <laughs> so that's how our manjus came along to be. That's, that's, that's how they cook. We used everything that we can utilize and dry. So the fruit, the nuts, it kept us very healthy. All of a sudden, you know, they have speeches, you got a whole page on the Daily Star telling you like, hey, that's how good it is. This is what you should eat. We ate less years ago. Lentils now, it's very, very good all of a sudden. We ate that, uh, God knows how long ago we ate less chuck, which was very good for us. Now, all the Macedonian people, they have this within themselves, within the household. The only thing you have to do is appreciate it because it was kept as a tradition from the Baba. That what was excellent. Anything else? You want to know anything else? <laughs> I just want to mention something. I try to dry peppers here because I have a big garden. Well, the climate is too wet, first of all. Secondly, secondly, we don't have as many sunny days. In Macedonia, if you read statistics, there's at least 235 sunny days of the year. Okay, so therefore, the dryness of the climate, the sun, makes the drying my, by far a better process than here. So well, well, there's well, a difference. You can do some drying here. No, you can. You can do. You some can buy drying. a dryer. You no, can buy a dryer. you don't even have to do that. You can do some drying. Make sure you buy the peppers. They're well wiped, first of all, and then. You're going to turn your oven at 200 degrees preheat. Bring it down to 150 and spread your peppers evenly on the rack. And you leave them 24 hours. You put them in the morning and you pick them up the next morning practically dry. And no mud, no fuss. And you do the same thing with your tomatoes. Well, on the grill, it has to be on, on the grill. It has to be air. The tomatoes, I put them in the tepsia because they're too wet. They make too much of a mess in the. The convection oven would be excellent. So you'll have your dry poppy, your dry tomatoes, and you, you can do your mushrooms. It's very unfortunate that uh, we can't come up with the mushrooms that uh, the Manitari, but you can buy them at the Italian market if you're willing to pay $52 a little bag. Mm -hmm. That's the Manitari. And the Resulki, you can find them a very small, uh, due to the fact I'm interested in food, you can find them at Sunkist in a very small little boxes, and they look like a little sponge at the lower part, and little ruffles on top. Again, they're very, very expensive, 
but if you want to experiment with them, they're very, very good for you. Instead of eating a steak, you can have that. That would be equivalent to nutrition of, uh, if you take that. So they are here. Cooking Baba's cooking in Canada, it's a lot easier, it's a lot faster, and you can cook it any which way you want. The only thing you have to do is put a little bit of love in it and then you'll got it. How do they make wine and whiskey? <laughs> oh, that's another story. We should live it for another lecture, another that one, lecture. the wine. Yeah. Well, if you like to try our food, we have a shuta manja there. You got the recipe in the newsletter. And we have the pinjur, which Yana made excellent, and our fresh bread. Now you try that, and we'll try to keep up with our newsletter and our recipe once or twice a year for you to try. And I hope you enjoyed our lecture, and thank you for coming. Thank you.